calling out to me. So just like we have maritime forests along our coastlines where the trees and all the life and the ecosystem is completely dictated by the salt that comes rolling in off the ocean, so too do we have what you might call a snow forest. And that's what's behind me right now. It's what we call a boreal forest. And every aspect of this place is dictated by the snowfall in the wintertime the productivity of the ecosystem, whether or not we have fire seasons, all of that is ultimately controlled by the snow. So the boreal forest is not a place that gives up its secrets very easily. Because of how dense this ecosystem is, we really kind of lose all ability to see things. We've lost our line of sight. You can see from the forest behind me here just how thick everything is. And so when we're working in this sort of environment, when we're looking for wildlife out here, a lot of times we're actually using our ears more so than our eyes to find those animals. While working my way along the edge of this forest, I actually heard the sound of a flock of birds mobbing a predator. It's a very distinct sound. It's basically kind of a cacophony of all these different species calling and squawking, and you can tell that something's not right, that everybody's upset about something. And that's one of the things I'm always listening for when I'm working inside of this type of environment. And so I'm going to go ahead and strap on snowshoes and work my way into this forest here to see if I can't find what's disturbing these birds. I'm going to guess that it's probably either going to be a marten or or an owl. Uh, this area right here, it's absolutely fabulous for all sorts of different species of owls this time of year. Everything from saw wets to boreals to northern hawk owls and great gray owls all congregate into these boreal forests here along the edge of Yellowstone National Park in the winter. take the bird sounds that I heard. In this environment, especially during this season, for them to make noise like that ultimately makes them a target. Now all of a sudden, they put themselves in the position of becoming a victim, of becoming prey, by announcing their presence to all other predators in this environment. So that means if they're making noise like this, if everybody's freaking out like this, they're doing it for a reason. And the reason is they're trying to alert the rest of the forest to the presence of this predator, essentially. And it's these sort of details that ultimately allow us to go out into the forest and locate the subjects that we're looking to photograph. Quite simply, the better naturalist you are, the better wildlife photographer you have the capability of becoming. So it doesn't really matter what you're out trying to photograph. Understanding the natural history of the species that we're trying to work with ultimately will give us as photographers an edge over being able to capture these incredible images. So let's just take red foxes, for example. That species actually has about an 80% success rate at catching food as long as it's facing towards the magnetic north or the magnetic south. And so what these animals are actually doing, they're using the Earth's magnetic field as something of a range finder to help them triangulate the distance of themselves to the subject itself. And so if we know that they have an 80% success rate, as long as they're facing in one of two directions, that means as photographers, we can anticipate the sort of grid pattern that these animals are going to be working in the field. And we can then in turn set ourselves up either to the east or to the west of that red fox to, to be able to get into place and find a pleasing background and set up and wait for that fox to come into position. So you see, understanding this sort of stuff is ultimately what makes or breaks a good wildlife 
photographer. Of course, you can just drive around Yellowstone National Park and just look for wherever other photographers are pulled over to the side, get out, go stand in line, and take pictures right beside them. That is one way that people make photographs out here. But you are always going to be a significantly better wildlife photographer if you understand these sort of nuanced details about the natural history of your subjects. And so then there's my all-time favorite species to photograph in the wintertime in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and that's the bobcat. So you see with bobcats, they don't fare very well in deep snow. That's kind of the, that's sort of the territory of the lynx, if you will. Bobcats, on the other hand, they actually start to descend to lower elevations into places with shallower snow depths come wintertime. And so when you have a river or a creek that remains ice-free throughout the wintertime, it's not unusual to have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bobcats that's all concentrating into a relatively small stretch of that river to hunt for food. So when they come down to these rivers like this, what they're doing is they're actually utilizing the log jams that build up along the banks of those creeks and rivers as ambush points where they can kind of tuck themselves into and then launch out at waterfowl as they come floating past. And so I would say it's safe to assume that easily 99% of the photographs that I have created of bobcats in the wintertime have occurred simply because I knew that little piece of information right there. So I get out into the snow, I start trekking about with binoculars in my hand, and I start studying the snow all around every single log jam that I come across. And when I see what I think are cat tracks, what I'll do is I'll actually hunker down in the snow myself, and I'll spend a little bit of time just basically studying every nook and cranny of that log jam. And so then it's just a matter of kind of waiting the cat out. Of course, there's not much of a photograph to be made when you just have these little eyes peering out of a log jam across a river or a creek, but given enough time, those cats will then come back out of that ambush point and they'll move down the river and they'll look for another log jam to try out. And so again, understanding what's going on in the natural history of these animals is what has allowed me to be successful with bobcats in the wintertime out here. To be a successful wildlife photographer, you have to be able to go beyond the basics of your camera. You've got to know more than just how to create a proper exposure. You've got to know more than how to just simply stop the action or work with low light or work with high ISOs. You've got to actually understand how to find the animals. If you're going to do more than simply drive around a national park and wait to find a bunch of other photographers stopped on the side of the road, then you're going to actually have to learn a little bit about natural history. You're going to have to learn your subject. You're going to have to learn how to become some sort of a naturalist because that's a big part of all of this stuff. Understanding the behavior and the natural history and the ecology of the subjects that we're looking to photograph, that's going to mean so much more than understanding the nuances of all the technicalities of photography. It doesn't matter how technically perfect of a photographer you are, if you can't find the wildlife, if you can't find unique species, if you can't get out into the woods and do this sort of stuff on your own, then you're never going to succeed at this game.